I don't think about it in terms of fatigue. I'm, I'm literally thinking about it in terms of stress. Because what if I can apply stress to my client over the exact right time horizon and disrupt homeostasis without them actually being fatigued? You didn't feel fatigue. You're listening to Barbell Logic, brought to you by Barbell Logic Online Coaching, where each week we take a systematic walk through strength training and the refining power of voluntary hardship. Welcome to Barbell Logic. I'm Scott Hambrick. That is Matt Reynolds, and today we're going to talk about the fitness fatigue um, model of, I don't know, model of what? Yeah, programming. It's really it's a discussion of SRA of stress recovery adaptation. I think we need to continue to hone in on this, and um, I think this would be a good show to give a caveat that says like really nobody knows, and uh, we're all trying to work through this and try to figure out hone in a little bit on what's actually going on with this relationship between stress um, of the workout and then the the combination of fatigue and recovery to get to the a- adaptation. And so um, I read a book called uh, oh, Super Training. No, it wasn't Super <laughs> Training. It was, uh, oh, it was The Science and Practice of Strength mm-hmm. Training by Vladimir Zatsiorsky. I believe that book came out like 96. I'm not looking at it. I know one of you guys are going to send me something and say it was 1991 or whatever. But whatever, post communism fallen in, in Soviet Union, he came over here. And I, I believe Zatsiorsky became a. Uh, professor at Penn State again all of these facts could be entirely wrong but that's what I remember in my in my Reynolds head and so um, this is the first place he called it the dual factor theory is what he called it but it's really the fitness fatigue theory and so if we back up a second and we go through the stress recovery adaptation cycle theory as a matter of fact you tell the listeners what is SRA how do we look at SRA in a very simple model um, that was posed by Hans Cellier. Yeah. Uh, the, the idea is that um, organisms, when subjected to a stress, if the stress does not overcome them, um, it they adapt to that stress and then they exhibit an adaptation for the stress that leaves them more resilient. So, the, one of the examples that we all, all like to give is uh, in the spring, you go out on that first sunny day, you're pale as a ghost. You get some UV radiation, it pinkens you up. You get a little, maybe you get a little bit of a sunburn, but sure enough, you get a little darker. And then the next time you go out, you don't, you don't burn. And so the stress was the UV radiation. The adaptation was melanocytes made melanin, and you get a little darker. And now you're more UV resistant than you were, and now you don't burn. And that seems to take place for any stress that an organism can undergo. Uh, and so we put people under increasing loads over time. They adapt to that. They recover from it. And then they adapt by being able to move that load more readily next time. And we just, we game that to make ourselves stronger. Yeah. And I, I don't think that that is wrong. I actually think it's right. I do too. And the way Cellier, he talked about the general adaptation syndrome where the first stage was the alarm stage. Which the way to think about that is after if we if we put this on a workout or even say being out in the sun too long, the initial alarm stage is sort of the negative aspect of the stressor. So the stress uh, immediately you're you're tired, you're fatigued, your you know your performance is going to decrease because the negative piece of this, the alarm phase, is what is at play, and that that phase is then followed by I think he calls it the resistance phase, the resistance phase or something like that where the positive adaptations occur. So much so that if, if the amount of stress was correct or the duration of stress was correct, that the positive response from that stress after the negative response will actually be more than the negative response was and it will lead to an improvement in whatever the thing was, right? So just like you said, if you go out in the sun and you lay out there for 15 minutes and you, and you get a little pink and your body adapts to that. So the little pink, the little bit of tinge that next morning you get in the shower, ooh, I can feel it on my skin. It hurts a little bit. Two, three days later, that pink has sort of turned a little more shade of brown and you can go back out there for 15 minutes again and not turn pink. Or you could go out there for 16 minutes or 17 minutes and begin to adapt and let your body adapt. And so as you 
expose it to this stress, what Sellier said was that there was this initial negative response followed by a, a positive response, which we call the recovery stage, and ending in an adaptation, right? Is that fair enough? Are you? Uh, That's right. And, you know, you could uh, repeatedly expose yourself to increasing amounts of isocaine powder and build up a resistance to it. I don't even know what isocane powder is. Well, that's what, what, is, is what that's what the that's what the dude does in the Princess Bride, and then uh, is able oh, to drink drink the poison and live. Yes, yes, or raw bacon, you know, right. whatever, whatever. <laughs> can you can you to become? You can actually build up a resistance to salmonella. Right, yeah, in fact, to, to it definitely works one hundred percent. And so, don't please don't do that. <laughs> um, that was a joke. All right, but here's the thing. Here here is the problem with that. Well, first off, here's where that works really smooth. That works really smooth in in, the, in in a novice LP, right? Where you train on Monday, immediately after that training on Monday, you are you are tired and fatigued, and then in the day after that, or in the sometime in that period after that, your body recovers, and by the time you come back on Wednesday, you're a stronger version of yourself. Your body has super compensated, is the word they say, right? Right. You are actually stronger than the person was on Monday, and you do the same thing on Wednesday. And you stress the body, and your body is fatigued from the stress. You have this negative response to the stress, followed by the positive recovery and then adaptation side, which then leaves you stronger. And that works beautiful and clean as long as every single, we, we talked about this some in our program, if every single macro cycle is just that Monday and Tuesday, and we start a new macro cycle on Wednesday and Thursday. You, if your entire cycle, one workout, stress, recovery, and adaptation all occurs between one workout to the next, that's clean. But here's the question, and the sun example works just fine too. What really happens is you go out in Mexico and you lay in the sun for 15 minutes or 30 minutes or an hour on Monday and you get a little bit burnt and you don't stay in your hotel room for the next five days until your body completely recovers from that sun exposure and go back out, what do you do? We go back and get in the sun on Tuesday. And there's still some negative effects left over from the sun on Monday on Tuesday. But God damn it, you just paid $3,500 for this trip to Cancun. You're not going to sit in your hotel room the whole time. And so the process of sitting out in the sun or exposing your body to repeated bouts of stress before the fatigue has dissipated, and the same is the case in training, mm -hmm. is we now have to look at SRA in a little bit different light. We, have, we can actually hone in on this a little bit, and that's what the fitness fatigue model says. It actually says that the stressor that occurs in the weight room or in the sun or whatever you want, that performance is affected is sort of a, an average between, it's this relationship between the positive effects of that stressor and the negative effects of that stressor. So for example, if I do something I've never done before, so I'm going to bench press five pounds more than I ever have for three sets of five. The positive effect of that is an adaptation response that is coming that will make my body stronger. So it Damn. is, and it's what they call improved fitness occurs. However, we also know that in the short term, immediately after performing that, there's fatigue. So there is some improved fitness long term, but there is fatigue in the short term. Now, when the people originally decided to do this, as a, let me just say, they made this theory that fitness and fatigue, the time was about a three to one ratio. So they said like, hey, the fit, the leftover, like the fitness time frequency point takes three days and the feet fatigue only takes one or if it takes six days, fatigue lasts for two. So that fitness lasts three times as long as the fatigue does. And I'm going to just say right out that clearly they don't actually know that. Yeah. We don't actually know that. It obviously depends on the amount of stress. But what's important to understand is, is that when I get past novice LP and I'm moving on to that next step of minimum effective dose change, what I'm doing is I'm managing not just the SRA cycle as a whole, but I'm managing both the amount of stress it takes to initiate or get to an adaptation, which is the fitness piece, while also trying to manage the amount of fatigue present in my body. Because once I can't completely recover from Monday to Wednesday, but I still have to train Wednesday, there's some fatigue left over. And it, that line starts to shift in a different sort of direction. So the question is, how much fatigue is caused by a single workout? 
and how much fitness is caused by a single workout. Well, it depends on how much stress the single workout caused, right? If it was a real easy workout and it wasn't that stressful, it's not going to cause that much fatigue. But what if you already have a little bit of fatigue there? What if on a scale of one to 10, you've got some like level three fatigue and then you go in and do a pretty damn hard workout? Well, now how much fatigue do you have two days later? Well, more than three, right? I don't know, five, six, I mean, it depends on the person. What we have to understand from a programming perspective is, is there's no way to cleanly program anyone past the novice phase with simple stress recovery adaptation because the entire macro cycle is allowing for stressors to occur, fatigue to occur, the relationship between those things to happen, and in the end, the goal is improved performance. I can't improve performance as, a, as, a, as an advanced lifter every single workout or even every single week. At some point, that becomes two weeks or three weeks, and then it becomes four, and then it becomes eight, and then it becomes 12. And I can't truly increase performance and hit PRs across the board. As I become more and more advanced, I can't do that in these short little time windows. Yeah, takes- and therefore, you, it's hard to that, – that's why when somebody takes a week-long a week long workout – it's like a, a volume day, a light day, and a heavy day. And they look at it and they say, well, the volume day was the stressor, the light day was the recovery, and the heavy day was the performance increase. I think you're looking at it wrong. I right. think that all three are a combination of both stressors that will, that will initiate an adaptive response and managing the fatigue there so that you don't fatigue so much that performance actually comes down long term. Does that make sense? Yep. Yeah, so we have to we have to introduce some sort of stress that disrupts homeostasis, or you won't tan. Correct. Or you won't get stronger. And as you get stronger, it takes longer and longer and more and more work to disrupt homeostasis. So we actually require them to start to get beat up, beat down a little bit, so that we can disrupt homeostasis. So if you think about this, like if you have to pull a twelve hour shift, probably not that big a deal. The end of the day, you're tired, you come home, your feet are tired, you kick your shoes off, you eat, you go to bed, the next morning you're okay. You work two 12s, hmm, all right. Okay, we're in week three of 12-hour shifts and we haven't had a day off in 22 days. Yeah. You're beat down. Yeah. And now and not, and not everything's just beat down. And at this point, one more eight-hour shift without a day off <laughs> is definitely disrupting your homeostasis in May in terms of your workload overtrain you. So the, the, the weightlifting is no different. Right. Three sets of five at 300 at some point will disrupt your homeostasis and put you into a recovery state, a state where you must recover from the work. Later on, that's not enough work to do that. But it can, right. but it can load you up a little bit. Contribute. So that next t- – so, so sure. that tomorrow when you go squat, now, now 300 with back-to-back squat sessions – can maybe disrupt homeostasis. So the 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 horizon over which we accrue the stress, which disrupts homeostasis, gets longer and longer and longer. And in this fatigue model they're talking about, they're like they're talking about the stress in terms of fatigue. It's a proxy for talking about how much stress has the person undergone, I believe. And and, and, and that right. fatigue, I think, is actually the delta between work that ain't making me stressed and the work that is making me stressed. I can walk yeah, around all day long. Right. It's not very stressful. But if I start running intermittently, the amount above the walking that was stressful, that is the fatigue that they're measuring in that model, I think. So I'm not really looking at it. I don't think about it in terms of fatigue. I'm, I'm literally thinking about it in terms of stress. Because what if I can apply stress to my client over the exact right time horizon and disrupt homeostasis without them actually being fatigued? I know that's an impossibility, but we're just talking about in theory, Matt. You, you know what I'm saying? Like, sure. what if I yeah. could? What if I'm doing your programming, sure. and I've got it dialed in? Like, I got an EKG machine on you. I'm taking muscle biopsies on the fo- on the hour. Like, I know it. I got you figured out. I'm like, got you on a feeding tube. <laughs> like, I know what you're eating. I got everything. I put you out with propofol, like Michael Jackson, every night, and you're sleeping like a baby, and. Everything's perfect. <laughs> what if I could just drive up the stress over the exact right time horizon 
so that you never yeah. never were fatigued. Fatigued. You didn't feel fatigue, right? Like the thing I worry about is when sure, we talk about this, people are like, oh, I'm going to work until I feel really tired, and now my programming's right. That's not what we're talking about. Right. <laughs> sure. The fatigue is the delta between what you used to could do and what you need to do now to drive the recovery and the adaptation process. Yeah, that's that's fair. Although I think if you if you argue from the opposite standpoint, we've talked on the show before, if we actually just focus on fatigue, on the recovery part. Yep, you're and right. You go, well, as a novice, you can train on Monday, recover on Tuesday, train on Wednesday, recover on Thursday, train on four, and, and eventually can't do that. So now we're going to train and we're going to have two rest days between the two workouts. And then we're going to have three rest days between the – and so if, if it is a, if it is a, a uh, singular vari- variable, if it's just stress, I don't think that works in the real world. And if it's just fatigue or You're just right. recovery, I don't think it works in the real world either because you can't – so that's why I think this works best. You go, well, the amount of stress that you have here has to be enough to disrupt homeostasis enough to get the adaptation that we're looking for. And again, that – we shouldn't have to go back and say this, but let's be clear. Like that stress must be specific to the goal because you, you were mentioning earlier, there's lots of stress that occurs yep. in your life that is not specific to the goal of getting stronger, which is what we're specifically talking about here, right? There's work stress and family stress. You didn't sleep well the night before. You ate something bad at the Mexican restaurant, had diarrhea four times yesterday. All of those things are stressful and, and none of them are stress that are associated with the actual stress specific. of what you did in the weight room. But, but, they, but they will affect the performance in the weight room. So the, the delta between the improved fitness from the workout and the fatigue or, yeah, the fatigue or the, the drop in performance, there's a middle line there somewhere, which is how, what your performance is currently at. And immediately after the workout or immediately after a hard set of sessions where there is significant fatigue present, the performance is reduced. But at some point, that some of that fatigue will dissipate, and if timed correctly, along with continuing to give stressors so that detrain do, detraining doesn't occur because I still have to have the stressor to still get the adaptation, at some point, that performance level rises above where I was, above baseline, and becomes an in improved amount of performance. And so what we're doing here is we're taking the original SRA model, which is fantastic. And, and Cellier was, I mean, it was, it was, it was life changing at the time that he was, it was stuff that I think humans had sort of known for thousands and thousands of years, but he identified that, hold on. If you expose the organism to a stress, it is going to respond to the stress or the stress will kill it. That's what, right. Like you're going to get to the point where you can't, adapt right so and that's right except for what if you're you, what if you are the organism is exposed to repeated bouts of stress before the recovery is dissipated or before the fatigue is dissipated and recovery has occurred in a day, like that's that's where it gets complicated well with an advanced lifter who's training four days five days a week on a 12 week long cycle and you've bumped up their frequency so that they're doing most of the lifts all the major, like let's say the, the three or four major lifts that they're doing, they're doing all of those three times a week. And they're going heavy at least once or twice on each of those. And they're doing some amount of volume to get additional stress. They're like, this is, the, I, this is why we have to understand the relationship between the, the work that we're doing and the, the adaptation that can come from that work and its relationship to the fatigue that that work causes. Because when we understand that first as a foundation, then I think we can start to understand how intensity, volume, and frequency, what their roles play in this programming. You can start to look at it, man, and go, okay, well, for someone who is intermediate or advanced, if, the, if you lift really, really heavy but really low volume, how much fatigue does it, does it cause and how long in duration is that fatigue? really, really heavy. My experience is, is when you lift really, really heavy, it causes a tremendous amount of fatigue for a very short period of time. That, now, listen, everybody's different. I get it. Maybe that's not your experience. And my experience with volume is, is that if I lift very high volume, 
that the residual effects of the fatigue of that high volume will last longer than high intensity. Therefore, it must be managed. Not that it's not wrong. It's I a think tool we in the toolbox. Yep. It's one of the things we have to use, right? So a tool in the toolbox. Frequency is the same thing, right? If I start to add in frequency, so now I'm adding in more and more bouts of stress in a specific time period, then now it gives me another stressor that I have to recover from instead of two days a week or three days a week, it's four days a week. Instead of two squats a week, it's three squats a week, it's four squats a week, right? All of these things come into play and this is all just the relationship between the two effects that come from training, the positive effects and the negative effects. And they are constantly at work together. There's this positive thing that occurs, which is leads to the adaptation. There's this negative thing that occurs, which is the stress, right? It is the fatigue. It is the thing that I'm yeah, trying to recover from. I hate the word fatigue because there's, there's like a whole bunch of midwits listening right now. And they're like, man, if I can just really get petered out from my workouts, I'm going to get stronger. Yeah. In a, sure. Well, I yeah, hate the fitness term fitness even worse. But I mean, but this is the, I didn't write the, I mean, yeah. if we change the words, then, you know, I'm not trying to steal somebody's right. intellectual property here. The, the, you know, the studies have been written. It's called the fitness fatigue theory. So you just have to understand they probably didn't choose the right words. But you're right, you're right, right? So the idea is that there, there's a relationship between the two effects from a training bout. One is positive, which is fitness, what they mean, which is also recovery, the word that we have used. And the other one is negative, which is fatigue, the word they use, and the word we use and is stress. I, I actually, fitness doesn't bother me that much because fitness means that you have, like, goodness of fit to that stress. You, you, you know, uh, okay. so I, I get it where they get that. And, and this... You know, a lot of people are like, oh, they're playing semantics here. But I think that we, if we, we need to, we need to understand what these terms mean so we can actually get at, you know, the underlying concepts. And because uh, oftentimes I know there are people hearing the word fatigue and they're smuggling in the idea that, man, if I can just get hot, sweaty, and tired, I'm going to get stronger. Right. Because that's fatiguing. Sure. sure. Colloquially. That's but right. here they're talking about a very, very specific thing. They're talking about a physical effect that occurs. When you um, when you undergo an increased stress from the last time, there's a physical effect, um, right. and that physical effect, depending on what the stressor was, is specific to that that stressor. The Which means for us, force, us force production. I mean, it could be anything. It could be I'm running for a marathon, and it's the same sort of thing. But because of what we do here, we're literally talking about force production is the adaptation yep. we're trying. And so we to undergo improve. this stress, this this stress which causes this. This fatigue, which is this amorphous thing that drives all kinds of adaptations, it makes your muscles more vascular, makes the cross-sectional size of them go up. It might, it might create, it might make us uh, create some more motor units. Hell, I don't know. It might make your bones more dense, et cetera, and renders you able to f produce more force next time. Because the whole time the body's thinking, I got to do this or we might get killed. If this yeah. keeps happening, it's going to kill me. Yeah, so I've got to do something about it. I've got to rise and meet this challenge to, to protect uh, my genome so I can get it out into the future for all you people that aren't reproducing out there. <laughs> our our <laughs> listeners need to reproduce. Joe Rogan's listeners, I, there's a subset, right? Like there's a Venn diagram of Barbell Logic listeners that intersects the circle of people who are the Joe Rogan podcast listeners. And the Joe Rogan podcast listeners that aren't in the little Venn diagram but should our people be. should reproduce. Okay. Well, that's good life philosophy. That's good. So, uh, so that's the theory behind the fitness fatigue model. And for 80% of our listeners, we just shot completely over their heads. So let's make it real practical for them what that means. And to me, there's really two ends of that spectrum. I got a guy I'm thinking about right now that I've been coaching for just a little while at BLOC. And... Um, he is a competitive powerlifter and a not, not a super big guy. And for the first time or one of the first times in his life, I'm making him deadlift while there's still clearly back fatigue present. And he is uh, not, not questioning my knowledge, but he's, he's asking good questions. He's saying, I just want to make sure this is okay. And the answer is yes. The longer you lift... The, the only time in your life when you're going to be recovered from the previous workout going into the next workout is in the first month of LP. Yeah. That's it. And then there's fatigue left over, right? But no, but very rarely does somebody go out to the sun and get a little bit of pink on a vacation and be like, man, I can't, 
I don't, I can't go out on Tuesday because I got a little pink today. You know, like you can't, no, no, listen, we have to be able to continue to do more stress over time to get stronger. Got a little, we have to do more force production over time to get stronger, which means you're going to deadlift with a fatigued back as an intermediate and advanced lifter, you're going to deadlift with a fatigue back about 93% of the time. You have to. I can't stress your back enough in one bout to get an adaptation. i got to get you on the ropes. you got to lift heavy today. Right. You've got to lift heavy again in two days. you got to lift heavy again in three days. And now, sure. now you're taxed. Now you're at your limits. Now I can disrupt homeostasis. Now you've done all that you've kind of done all that you can do. And now I have to ask you to do more. In the beginning, that first deadlift session is the heaviest thing you've ever done in your whole life, and that's, that's right. enough. That's right. And that's later right. on, it takes days and days and days and months, even sometimes, right. to get people uh, to disrupt that homeostasis. Uh, yeah, so training with a base of fatigue, once you're out of the first month or six weeks of, of, a, of a novice linear progression, is perfectly okay. It's okay. There's not, not only is it okay, it's, it's warranted. It has to happen. It has to happen. But there's the other side of that equation, too, which is sort of the CrossFit version of that equation, which is those guys think they need to be fatigued and have systemic inflammation and soreness, quote unquote, live sore 100% of the time. And that's not true either, right? A lot of times we go in and do workouts and they're just part of, they're one of a contribution of deposits you're making into the into the stress bank account to build up enough work to disrupt homeostasis. And sometimes that's a Wednesday light day. Mm. That's, the, that's the first easy place to see it. You come in on Wednesday, it's Wednesday light day, and some of those Wednesday light days, especially the first one that you do, never feels like a light day. We've talked about this before. But sometimes light days do feel like light days. And sometimes you come in and the weight's not very heavy and the volume is relatively, like the volume is moderate to moderate high, but nothing's very hard. And sometimes the weight is decently heavy, but there's almost no volume. And you walk out of the gym, you're like, I don't know. I don't feel like it did that much. It's okay. It's okay as long as your coach knows what the hell they're doing in the programming. So you have to understand that both, it is okay to train under the duress of some fatigue mm -hmm. present in your body. But there are also going to be times that you're going to do sessions over that that macro cycle where it's not going to feel like it was a ton of work well that was a session that was used for for uh getting a little bit of work in uh, avoiding detraining working on form right all of those things that did not probably accumulate much more fatigue in that specific session that's what a wednesday day is for that wednesday light day is there because we're able to get in some work without increasing the amount of fatigue er very much early on though early on yeah exactly right but as time goes on, like there are days, right, where uh, you have a deload session. Now, you can just tell with a client, an advanced client, they come in and do a deload session, and they and we back off their intensity often by, you know, somewhere between ten and twenty percent, and we back off their volume often by fifty or sixty percent for a session or two, and let them get some recovery. And they still get in, they move, they feel better at the end of the workout, they feel better. There's nothing wrong with that. So the goal of the workout is not necessarily to cause fatigue. Uh, but also, it's okay to work out under fatigue. Both of those things are okay. Yeah, and I'm going to have to say it again. Fatigue here is a very, very specific thing. This different than hot, sweaty, and tired. Yeah. Is there anything else to, to say about this? Yeah, I just think the last thing for me is that if you've got a good coach, one of the things that's really important in managing this that I think sometimes people will hold back, especially if they're not as, uh, as transparent as guys like myself or, or you, is that they often won't talk about the stressors that aren't related to or the fatigue that is mm -hmm. not related to training. And so it's important if you have a relationship with your coach to if you if you had a bad night the night before, if you didn't sleep well, if you had an argument with a with a spouse or family member, if there's if there's work stress, if there's those are things you need to be able to talk about with your coach because your coach sometimes have to has to take those things into account that while the the stress needed to drive the adaptation much be, must must be specific the total fatigue that the body has been um, exposed to is is far reaching outside of what just occurred in the weight room. Yeah. Like, I don't know what's going to happen to you. Like, you get a sinus infection or, you know, you get sick or you've got to, you know, you decide to go like, I'll have clients sometimes that'll like re-roof their house. But boy, right. I just didn't work out. But the workout sucked. I did lay asphalt shingles all day yesterday. I was like, why didn't you tell me that? Like, that would, be, that would have been a good thing for me to know 
so that I could have programmed a, a little bit more of a back off here. I didn't need to drive your ass into the ground if you've been standing out in a 97 degree heat on top of asphalt shingles or carrying, you know, plywood sheets, four by eight plywood sheets up on your roof. Like, you know, things like that. Or you got to you got to let us know. What that is thing. that? Is it that they don't think it matters or is it macho bullshit? Like, what is that? I, I think it's it's one or the other. And then sometimes I think it's it's a. Uh, Honestly, man, sometimes I think it's a little bit of shame when it's not a physical thing. Like, you you know, if it's one thing to be like, oh, I went out and, you know, I, I, I worked in my garden for eight hours. Like, nobody really cares about that. But I think a lot of times those stressors are often much more emotional and mental. And they don't understand how much it affects their life on a physical level. So, you know, hey, I'm really stressed about work. I think I might lose my job. Hey, I found out my wife was cheating on me or we're going to, you know, like, dude, that's a that's a massive stressor, Move, right? I found moving. out my kid was on drugs. Like, you know, these things that occur or, or even a good thing, right? My, my daughter got married. Like, that is a massive stress, even if it went well, right. even if it was all great. Um, you know, we, I just moved into a new house. That was a massive, massive stressor. It all, it all is great. I'm happy. I'm in the new house. Things are good, but like that, it crushed my training for a little while. Yeah. And so those are things that you have to share with your coach. So I, whether that's an issue of you not wanting to be transparent, or whether you're just trying to be macho and be like, ah, it'll be fine. I'll just get through it. Those are still things that must be communicated to your coach to at least be taken. I mean, and they should be noted because as we go back, we've talked about the importance of a training log, or you know, you have a, you have that training notebook, you should be writing down the stressful things that are occurring in your life in that training log. So as you go back and try to figure out what's working and what's not, if you don't ever put any of that stuff like, oh shit, I forgot. We had a miscarriage that month. Like <laughs> Jesus. Yeah, I know. That's not funny. Well, it's funny. <laughs> but I mean, it's a big, because I just chose that one. Yeah. But I mean, it's just like, I, I chose it because I've been there. Yeah. Like it, yeah, it wrecks, wrecks your you. life for a while, you know? And so we, we those had, are things uh, that... We had a beloved pet pass away. Worst training That's session the, of my life was uh, yep. after we put that cat yeah. to sleep, you know? It's terrible. Yeah, exactly right. So understand training, the uh, effects of training, the adaptation that occurs is some combination of the relationship between the positive effects of those training, of that training, and the negative effects of that training. The positive being that, that fitness or recovery piece, and the negative being that fatigue or that stress piece. And that we're constantly trying to manage those. And so that's how stress recovery adaptation is not wrong, but just as time goes on, it becomes a little more complicated and we can hone in a little more with the fitness fatigue theory. So there's some good stuff out there to read. Um, I mean, there's, there's a lot of studies on this. And of course, a lot of them don't have to do with weight training, uh, but they still are, are good stuff. If you want to learn more, just get on PubMed or Google. There's all kinds of stuff out there that you can find and read about the fitness fatigue theory and kind of better understand the idea of stress recovery adaptation. There you have it. Another esoteric show from Barbell Logic. If you guys have any questions, send those things to questions at barbell-logic.com. Go to iTunes, give us a review. Go to Stitcher, give us a review. Um, go to Google Play and uh, pass the show around a little bit. We, we need you guys to uh, help us get the word out. We don't advertise the show. We don't We don't really have any way of getting other people to listen to it except through uh, you passing it on to somebody who you think is one, uninformed, two, misinformed, three, stupid, uh, or someone that you just want to help. So send that out to those people and uh, tune in. Uh, we'll just be back in a few days. Look at the head on that, Matt Reynolds.